House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record subject to the length and limitation of the rules. To insert something into the record, please have our staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with House Resolution 965 and the accompanying regulations, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate background noise. Uh, I see that we have got a quorum and now recognize myself for an opening remarks pursuant to this notice. We're holding a hearing today entitled Transatlantic Cooperation on Countering Global Terrorism and Violent Extremism. I'll now recognize myself uh, for five minutes. This month, on the 20th anniversary of September 11th, I attended a memorial service in my district to mourn the loss of all those who died that day, including 206 Massachusetts residents, and to honor the sacrifice made by others to prevent such an atrocious attack on our country from ever happening again. During the service, I was struck by how quickly 20 years can go by. It's truly really remarkable how our global society has fundamentally altered in so many years and ways uh, responsible as a result of this action, which opened our eyes uh, to the threat of global terrorism and violent extremism. At the same time, uh, I realized how important our transatlantic alliance has been for keeping us all safe and decided to hold a hearing to explore what mechanism uh, and what actions we've taken uh, to build in, in the years since 19, uh, since 9-11. As such, this hearing will cover the successes, challenges, and opportunities of our transatlantic collaboration to counter terrorism and violent extremism. But before I make my opening statement, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to Chairman Deutsch uh, for his leadership and for holding this hearing. Your work highlighting multilateral counterterrorism efforts through the Subcommittee on the Middle East and North Africa, of which uh, I've been a member, is virtually, uh, is vitally important. And I hope we can continue to work together to highlight transatlantic cooperation in this space. Let me turn to the topic we are here to discuss today. Since World War II, the United States and Europe has created the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. Together, we've committed ourselves to our collective defense and made a promise to show up when needed. That promise, with that promise in place after 9-11, our NATO partners did just that. With Article 5 triggered, they came to our defense, and since uh, our allies have staunchly uh, served alongside us in places like Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, often making the greatest of sacrifices, just as our American soldiers have, to ensure the safety and security of all our citizens. Alongside our activities on the ground, the US-EU cooperation, importantly, has also expanded our ability to share information and to share lessons learned. We've built robust mechanisms meant to counter terrorism and violent extremism, such as money laundering, trafficking in humans, drugs, nuclear and radiological substances, terrorist financing, repatriation, and judicial proceedings for foreign fighters, container security, and irregular migration, just to name a few. The EU and the US have also simplified their extradition procedures and promoted mutual legal assistance. As a result, the US is Europol's largest partner in terms of the number of joint cases conducted. And the Federal Bureau of Investigation is the US agency that contributes the highest volume of information to the EU. Altogether, these agreements, institutions, and rules are vital for us to continue to live in relative peace, achieve security, and prosperity for all of our citizens. Now, in a time when we're reviewing the state of global terrorism and violent extremism, it's more important than ever to remember what we've created so far and recommit ourselves to those mechanisms that ensure our way of life, which is grounded in the values of freedom, democracy, and human rights. The question now is how the United States and Europe can maintain 
this transatlantic bond that served as a bulwark against threats to our collective security. To answer this critical question, my colleagues and I have invited a group of incredibly knowledgeable uh, experts with a diverse range of professional experiences. They include Deputy Director General for the Migration and Home Affairs at the European Commission, Olivier Oneidin, founder and CEO of Moonshot, uh, Vidya Ramalingam. I am by. Uh, and get that correctly. I apologize. I'll get it before this hearing is over. Uh, the Royal United Services Institute, uh, Raphael Antucci, and the Washington Institute's Dr. Matthew Levitt. As longstanding experts in the field of countering terrorism and preventing the spread of global violent extremism, you'll be able to give concrete recommendations on the ways that the United States and the European Union can bolster cooperation in areas such as data sharing, privacy, de-radicalization and radicalization prevention initiatives, terrorism financing and sanctions, and irregular migration for foreign fighters. We thank you for being here today. President Biden highlighted the central lesson of the September 11th attack when he said, we saw something all too rare, a true sense of national unity, unity and resilience, a capacity to recover and repair in the face of trauma. It's that our most vulnerable and the push and pull of all of this makes us human. It unites us. It gives us our greatest strength. I could not agree more with this sentiment and venture to expand it to encompass transatlantic unity as one of the top priorities of myself and our respective subcommittees. With that, I welcome an honest assessment today, and we've been here uh, joining you at this critical time, uh, a time where we need to grow in our mutual quest to counter the threat uh, of terrorism and global violent extremism. Uh, I now will turn to uh, Ranking Member Wilson for his opening statement. this time of hearing today. With the increasing invigoration, scope and capability and funding of international terrorist organizations, cooperation and coordination with our friends and allies in Europe to combat and prevent terrorism have never been more critical, especially as Afghanistan has now become a safe haven for terrorist tra training. I am particularly hopeful for the United States relationship with the EU and NATO partners to conduct counterterrorism operations and share critical information. Technology, sadly, has made recruiting and proliferation of extremist content, content cheap and easy, which means we must recommit ourselves to solving this evolving problem. One area that we must close the gap with e EU is in regard to the designation of terrorist groups who pose a threat to our mutual friend and ally, Israel, and the United States and European Union countries. Iranian-backed Islamic extremist terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas pose an existential threat to Israeli families and seek to stabilize, destabilize regional normalization efforts. And yet, there is reluctance to name Hezbollah political wing as a terrorist group. A week ago, it was reported that Hezbollah imported Iranian fuel into Lebanon through Syria, welcomed by banners blatantly reading, quote, Thank you, Iran. Thank you, Assad, Syria, end of quote. There is no question that the Iranian regime seeks to export its draconian ideology, as is evident by Hezbollah presence in Latin America. I was grateful to introduce a bipartisan bill this week in Congress to address this issue and identify authoritarian regimes working with the Iranian-backed terrorist groups in the Western Hemisphere. I appreciate our distinguished witnesses for their expertise, and I look forward to hearing from each of you, and I yield back. I now recognize Ranking Member Fitzpatrick for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Keating. Uh, also, Chairman Deutsch and Ranking Member Wilson. So I believe you're muted. Oh, you can't. Oh, I... Can you hear me, Chairman? 
I can hear you. I now recognize the ranking member of Fitzpatrick for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Keating, and also to Chairman Deutsch and ranking member uh, Wilson um, for holding this important hearing. Uh, and to our esteemed uh, panel witnesses for being here with us today. 20 years ago, our nation was galvanized into action by the horrific terror attacks on September 11th of 2001. And our response was swift uh, and it was comprehensive. Uh, the United States bolstered law enforcement and intelligence capabilities. Uh, we created the Department of Homeland Security, uh, coordinated information sharing between agencies uh, and our allies overseas. And our military was operationalized uh, and less than 24 hours after the attacks, the North Atlantic Council invoked Article 5, uh, Collective Defense Clause, for the first time in the Alliance's history. Uh, we are forever grateful uh, for how our NATO allies joined us in our time of need, sacrificing greatly alongside of our own armed forces. Uh, and as was the case in 2001, uh, we are stronger when we work together. And for this reason, we continue to need our transatlantic allies to share the burden of what is required in the global fight and the global war on terror. Therefore, it's my hope today that our witnesses can discuss how uh, the U.S. can better coordinate our counterterror strategies with our closest allies. To date, the United States counterterrorism efforts uh, have been tactically successful. Uh, major attacks have been foiled, terrorist networks uh, have been broken, and the United States government's database of known or suspected terrorists has grown substantially. While our capabilities have grown uh, with experience, the threat posed by terrorism is far from eradicated. Uh, our campaign to eliminate global terrorism and violent extremism has revealed ugly truths about the origins of this phenomenon. Terrorism is fueled by local drivers and respects no borders. Uh, therefore, to stop radicalization, attention to good governance, support for the rule of law, uh, economic stability, and public health must all be tools used to address this worldwide issue. Uh, it is my hope today that Dr. Levitt can expand uh, on the points he made in his written testimony about utilizing soft power solutions to bolster civilian counterterrorism capacity uh, and establishing preventative methods uh, to get ahead of the radicalization curve. Soft power developments offer sustainable long-term solutions to counter terrorism and must be synced uh, with the strategies of our allies. Uh, as a former FBI special agent myself, uh, I would also be remiss not to mention uh, that Dr. Levitt worked as a counterintelligence uh, analyst uh, at the FBI in the wake of September 11th. I'd like to thank you, sir, for your service to our country, and I look forward to hearing from you and our other uh, witnesses this afternoon. I yield back, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Representative Fitzpatrick. And now I'd like to uh, recognize and turn the gavel over to the chairman, uh, Chairman Deutsch, uh, who will uh, conduct the hearing. Uh, and then uh, I'm sure uh, introduces the opening statement. Uh, Chairman Deutsch. Uh, thanks very much, Chairman Keating. I'm so glad to join you today for uh, this really important and timely hearing on transatlantic cooperation and countering violent extremism. We are uh, here, and I, I appreciate your leadership bringing us together. We're here today, 20 years after the events of September 11th, profoundly change the global approach to counterterrorism. We're here 20 years uh, after 20 years of war in Afghanistan, in which our NATO partners stood side by side with our troops. And we're here less than a month after that war now has come to a close. What happens next is certainly a question on everyone's mind, and there is no doubt that our withdrawal from Afghanistan, while the right thing to do, gave some of our transatlantic partners pause. 20 years ago, the collective belief was that violent, radical Islamic terrorism posed the greatest threat to our homeland and our interests. In the aftermath of 9-11, the U.S. and European partners worked together to track suspects, funds, uh, funding streams, and to collect intelligence in order to thwart future attacks. Certainly, even as, as Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan was being decimated, Al-Qaeda affiliates in the Arabian Peninsula, across Africa, and elsewhere continued to pose dangerous threats. The formation of ISIS and its affiliates changed the terror landscape as Americans and Europeans were threatened, kidnapped, and killed. Since 2014, horrific ISIS-inspired attacks in France, the UK, the Netherlands, and Belgium have forced the EU to grapple with a new wave of terror and the political consequences 
of balancing freedom and human rights with security. Although ISIS's territory may, uh, may be depleted, we know that its propaganda machine continues to actively recruit and inspire new followers. In recent years, we have also seen the global rise of violent white nationalism and far-right terrorism. And that terrorism that disproportionately affected the United States and many European nations. In the U.S., our deadliest attacks, be it the Tree of Life synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, Charleston AME church massacre, those have been carried out by white nationalists. And with the rise of social media and online propaganda, we face a new challenge of lone wolf attackers. Those radicalized online and inspired to commit deadly acts without the planning and backing of any specific terror group. We have seen Iranian-backed terror threaten the U.S. and our interests abroad, even launch attacks on European soils like the, soil like the 2012 bombing in Burgas, Bulgaria. So Hezbollah continues to actively fundraise across Europe, which is why many of us have worked hard to encourage the EU to designate Hezbollah in its entirety a terrorist organization. As we sit here today with 20 years of the war on terror behind us, and as we chart a new path of cooperation forward on counterterrorism in Afghanistan, it's time to reassess our counterterrorism strategy and our global partnerships. Our alliances are what keep us strong in the great power competition with China and Russia. We have some rebuilding to do after the past several years, and I'm aware that many of our transatlantic partners need to see actionable assurances from the United States that we remain committed to these vital partnerships. That's why President Biden continues to reaffirm the importance of alliances as he did uh, just this week at the UN General Assembly. Today, we'll examine the mechanisms and frameworks in place for the US and our European partners to join to jointly counter violent extremism. We'll also look at what has worked and what hasn't worked and how we can adjust our approaches for the types of threats that we currently face. I'm grateful to the witnesses for appearing today and sharing their expertise. I thank Chair Keating again, and I look forward to a productive discussion and continuing to affirm our commitment to the transatlantic partnership. Um, with that, uh, Chairman Keating has introduced the witnesses, so I'll now recognize the witnesses for five minutes each. We have, without objection, your prepared written statement will be made part of the record. And Mr. Oniti, you are now recognized for your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for, for this uh, uh, invitation. Uh, uh, thank you also to the ranking members and, and all honorable members, actually, of uh, both of your subcommittees. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, with you uh, in a position to testify on uh, uh, current uh, actual, uh, actually uh, efforts on both sides of the Atlantic uh, to uh, continue in uh, uh, the quest of reinforcing uh, the fight against uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, the subject is important. Uh, September 11th, uh, you've said it uh, sent uh, uh, shockwaves really as to uh, the dimension terrorism had uh, taken. Uh, but we've seen uh, throughout the years, uh, 20 years now, how close uh, both uh, the United States and uh, the European Union and its member states have actually come in uh, uh, setting in place uh, uh, the response uh, uh, to uh, global terrorism. We've joined forces uh, uh, abroad to defeat uh, uh, international uh, uh, terrorism organizations, and we should continue uh, doing this. Uh, the renewed commitment of the United States uh, uh, to remain active uh, uh, in uh, uh, the main parts uh, at risk, uh, for example, in the Sahel, is a, a very uh, important testimony to uh, this uh, engagement uh, uh, to continue of having our uh, military uh, forces uh, uh, engaged uh, uh, abroad uh, for that cause. We've learned also progressively to uh, set up uh, policy uh, responses uh, that were mutually reinforcing. Uh, when we talk about uh, the fight against uh, terrorism financing, there is no better example than uh, the terrorist financial tracking uh, program that has been instrumental in uh, cutting uh, the financial resources to uh, in, uh, organized uh, uh, terrorism groupings. Advanced passenger information, uh, passenger name records, have also been tools which we have not only developed in our own jurisdiction, but with which we are also uh, developing across the world uh, uh, in uh, different uh, uh, countries. 
information systems being used by our border guards and also the, the information that is actively being pushed in those uh, systems is another, uh, I guess, example of uh, how much we have done uh, together. We've brought our agencies, our operational uh, entities to actively to work together. There is no better example than uh, Europol uh, being uh, the hub in Europe of uh, uh, cross-border uh, transatlantic cooperation with uh, all relevant agencies being represented uh, and being closely associated to the work of uh, uh, Europol on uh, our side in terms of facilitating the exchange of information, providing support to investigations, but also then uh, looking at prosecution and the judiciary angle of uh, uh, the uh, um, cases. How to best understand what actually leads an individual to commit a terrorist act, uh, prevent uh, this to happen, uh, also rehabilitate uh, uh, individuals. This has become the prime uh, focus of our joint work because we've realized that most of the attacks these days are actually committed on our soil by uh, homegrown domestic uh, residents of uh, uh, our countries. And uh, we've done a lot of progress uh, in actually helping out the anticipation of uh, such uh, uh, acts. And I'd be very happy to uh, discuss in more details the type of uh, uh, cooperations we've set up on that. And then finally, the last point I wanted to highlight in this introduction, the online world, which has also been uh, a recognition that uh, most uh, of uh, the uh, in, in incitement, uh, the recruitment of individuals uh, led to commit terrorist attacks is actually happening online. Uh, in every attack over the last years in Europe, uh, there is uh, an important uh, uh, factor of uh, online radicalization. And here as well, we've seen us shouldering our efforts towards the internet uh, world, uh, uh, pushing to the companies uh, the obligation to do more uh, in order to identify and suppress uh, uh, terrorism incitement uh, material and also helping us uh, in uh, identifying those groupings uh, which were actually very active online. Afghanistan, you said it, is uh, another reminder of how important it is to continue this fight uh, together and certainly not uh, lower our guards uh, in this field. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Onidi. Um, Ms. Uh, Ramalingam, you're now uh, recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Chair Keating, Chair Deutsch, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick, Ranking Member Wilson, and members of the subcommittees. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I appreciate your leadership to ensure better international cooperation on countering global violent extremism. Throughout my career, I have worked to design and deliver terrorism prevention and de-radicalization models globally. Ten years ago, when a white supremacist terrorist murdered 77 people in Norway, I led the EU's first intergovernmental initiative on white nationalist terrorism and extremism. I worked with hundreds of policymakers, practitioners, social workers, and former extremists across 10 EU countries to gather evidence and design policy and programs on what worked in this pre in prevention of this form of terrorism. Today, I've taken this fight online as founder of Moonshot, an organization working with US and European governments to build online prevention mechanisms fit for the 21st century. Our work has been delivered with partners such as the US Department of State across administrations and the Global Coalition Against Daesh, with which we worked across over 80 coalition partners on online efforts to degrade terrorist recruitment. The last 20 years has seen considerable investment across Europe in terrorism prevention models, but what actually works? Based on my research and what the research and, and what research shows, the following components of various European prevention models have proven to be effective. One, they involve behavioral health methods. There is a vast evidence base demonstrating its efficacy, particu particularly counseling, which helps to adequately address underlying drivers and vulnerabilities and can facilitate referrals to other services. This has become the cornerstone of most European programs. Two, 
they are multidisciplinary and involve multi-agency systems, which can achieve better case management, drawing on expertise and pre-existing capabilities across social services, education, healthcare systems, and law enforcement. Three, they are locally established and run with substantive involvement from communities where they're deployed. Four, they need not be ideology focused, but rather span the ideological spectrum. Licensed practitioners, including psychologists, counselors, social workers, and others involved in these programs do require training to engage ideology when it arises, but ideology does not need to be addressed first and foremost. In fact, evidence shows sometimes this is counterproductive. Many long-standing European prevention programs engage individuals across the ideological spectrum at risk of Salafi jihadism, neo-Nazism, violent incels, and potential mass shooters alike. Five, they offer off-ramps for those looking to leave violent extremism. Off-ramping and exit programs, such as those in Sweden, Finland, and Germany, demonstrate high caseloads and low recidivism rates, and have served as the model for life after hate here in the United States. And finally, these programs tend to be more effective and credible when they are independent of government, but have stable government funding. Accountability is critical, but a bit of independence gives programs, especially exit programs, greater authority with those who are looking to leave violent extremism. But perhaps the greatest challenge for these efforts is how to bring these prevention models into the 21st century. Social media creates new opportunities for perpetrators to reach vulnerable audiences and has supercharged the spread of violent extremist content. In 2021, every terrorism prevention model needs a robust digital component. Moonshot has spent six years working with governments to design and implement digital complements to offline terrorism prevention infrastructures. This must be done safely, ethically, and responsibly. First, the entire suite of prevention services needs to be adapted for online delivery, including risk assessment frameworks and counseling services. Secondly, we need to adequately signpost terrorism prevention services such as hotlines, counseling, and exit offers online. Third, online prevention frameworks must be designed with user privacy at its heart. Evidence shows us that this works. In Moonshot's recent studies, audiences at risk of jihadism were 47% more likely than the general public to take up offers of psychosocial support services online. Neo-Nazis were 48% more likely. And this year alone, Moonshot has channeled over 100 individuals at risk of violent extremism across the United States into text messaging counseling sessions via online engagement. We need to acknowledge that the tech companies are not doing enough in this fight. As we continue to hold these companies to account, we do have an obligation to adapt our terrorism prevention infrastructures to this new reality. We must both learn from the past and look to the future in our fight against global terrorism. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ramalingam. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Raphael and Tucci for your opening statements. Thank you very much. Um, Chairs Keating and Deutsch, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick and Wilson, Distinguished Committee Members uh, and fellow speakers, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been touched on already by some of the earlier speakers, and I'm conscious that this is a space where there's a lot of thinking and work going on, and um, I, I, I recognize I'll repeat some points, but what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about two very specific parts of the current terrorist threat that is faced by the Transatlantic Alliance. Counterterrorism, of course, remains a major threat and in many ways has become infinitely more complicated than it was two decades ago. There is a wide range of threats out there and to cover them all in the time available will be an exercise in futility. So I will focus on two slightly disparate areas that I think merit particular priority attention at the moment lone act to terrorism and the fallout from Afghanistan, both issues that I think we've already heard speakers talking about already. The lone actor threat is repeatedly identified by senior security officials in both Europe and North America as the biggest and most complicated problem that they currently face. The most recent annual Europol report highlighted that these are becoming the most frequent and regular attacks that Europe was facing, and they noted that they were becoming ever harder to detect. 
This is all not to say that terrorist groups do not have the desire and ambition to launch large scale terrorist plots, but it's a testament to our successful security capabilities that we have enabled essentially such a difficult environment for them to try to launch the attacks that the only ones that we're actually seeing able to get through are these lone actor ones. But that does also emphasize why this is an area that we really need to focus more attention on in trying to respond. Um, and second, Afghanistan, I want to highlight in particular, as that particular threat is, of course, come to our attention once again. It's not a particularly new problem and threat, um, but it has, of course, been brought into sharper focus due to recent events, and it has shifted the dial on the particular problem and requires us to think a little bit more carefully about how to manage some of the consequences and problems that might emanate from it. And I want to offer three specific areas for potential cooperation going forwards on these two broader areas of terrorism. To start with the lone actor side of the threat, as has been already discussed, the lone actor threat really is becoming the sharp end of the threat picture that we see. But it is becoming increasingly confusing. And we see that the ideologies that individuals who are committing lone actor terrorist attacks are becoming increasingly idiosyncratic. They're becoming an odd mix of left, right, Islamist, all getting muddled up into individual cases. And increasingly, these ideologies are getting muddled back and forth across the Atlantic generated sometimes in our very own communities in the United States or in Europe, in part an extension of the very polarized political conversation that we increasingly see in our respective countries. This makes them very difficult to manage because when you're looking at some of these threats and the ideologies that are spawning them, you're looking at things that are sitting on the edge of the mainstream political discourse, which makes it very hard to try to craft a specific response to crack down on these and to get legislation that will deal with this effectively. The problem being, of course, that we have different perspectives on where the law should lie with particular ideologies. But I think greater coordination is clearly needed and a greater conversation on trying to understand where we both see these threats lie and understanding how different you know, hyper uh, ideologies in one in Europe or North America will have a very direct impact on the threat picture in the other side and particularly on the lone actor side of the threat. The second one is on the tactical side. Um, a lot of this problem is happening online, as has been highlighted by previous speakers. Um, and clearly, the United States has a far superior capability in many ways of conducting preventative actions and very aggressive counterterrorism activity in the online space. Um, greater coordination and cooperation within the space is clearly going to be essential, but ensuring that these tools are being used in a proportionate manner and ensuring that, as a previous speaker mentioned, social media companies are being particularly focused on in trying to ensure that they are addressing their side of uh, the equation. And then finally, on the preventative side, as was also already highlighted, on the preventative side of the coin, you're looking at an issue which is becoming very um, individualized. And you're looking at trying to respond to lone actor threats that are being dealt with by a wide range of different actors, from social services through to hard security actors. Ensuring that these people are communicating and sharing best practices across the Atlantic will, I think, be critical, because I think it's no longer going to be the case that a single answer to this problem exists. It never really did anyway, but I think that's becoming even more realistic. So learning from each other's experiences within the space will be increasingly critical. To look very briefly at Afghanistan, conscious that I'm coming up against time, I want to talk about three specific aspects. First, we're talking about this an awful lot within the context of how the threats from Afghanistan may come home. And yet the real problems are more likely to happen in Afghanistan's neighborhood. Understanding how the transatlantic alliance can manage the threats that are most likely to spawn most likely to appear in Afghanistan, uh, in Pakistan, or in Central Asia, is I think where we should be really focusing our attention in the short to medium term. Second, geopolitics. The transatlantic alliance was clearly pulled by the issues that we saw. But I think we need to be careful not to overstate this. And I think instead we need to start to think about focusing where it is that actually the United States and European allies can focus their attention. The UK, for example, has a deep experience in Pakistan, focusing attention there for the UK. Or in Central Asia, Germany has a very strong relationship with Uzbekistan. Um, France has a particular relationship with Tajikistan. Establishing these new sort of alliances to deal with the over-the-horizon threats that we may see emanating from Afghanistan, I think will be a critical thing a critical thing to focus on going forwards. And then absolutely finally, I think we really need to try to find ways of extricating Afghanistan from the great power conflict lens that it's increasingly being seen within. In focusing in on Afghanistan through this lens, we're going to do ourselves a disservice and potentially find stymie uh, our ability to respond to the very real potential terrorist threats that are likely to emerge. Um, and I will cede the floor there. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Santucci. Uh, and now the chair recognizes Dr. Matthew Levitt.
for five minutes uh, for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, chairs and ranking members. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. And I have to say it's a real pleasure to appear alongside Vidya, Raf, and Olivier, each of whom is a friend and an exceptional analyst. Over the past two decades, the United States built a counterterrorism bureaucracy to manage, resource, and operationalize the nation's response to the threat posed by Al-Qaeda in particular and terrorism more broadly. This counterterrorism up enterprise has been remarkably successful from a tactical perspective, foiling attacks and disrupting terrorist networks. Terrorists today are far less likely to be able to carry out a spectacular attack like 9-11. But from a strategic vantage point, our 20-year struggle against terrorism has been far less successful. Many more people today are radicalized to violent extremism than in 2001, representing a more ideologically diversified and globally dispersed terrorist threat. Consider that two decades after 9-11, the US government's database of known or suspected terrorists has grown by almost a factor of 20. Turn in the corner on this larger problem set, getting ahead of the radicalization curve, demands two interrelated changes to the now two decade old US approach to countering terrorism. First, we must invest in our own and our allies' civilian counterterrorism capabilities in ways that to date we have only done in the realm of kinetic military counterterrorism tool sets. This should involve a particular focus and investment in extremism prevention, which at its core is not a mission for counterterrorism agencies, but is rather the product of good governance, of rule of law, equitable and well-functioning societies and healthy communities. To get ahead of the terrorism problem will require seeing clinical social workers and local government as frontline responders to address violent extremism. Violent extremism is a global problem that has at its core very local drivers, which require local responses. Therefore, as underscored in the 2020 strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, a U.S. interagency plan submitted to Congress as required under the Global Fragility Act of 2019, military force should be only one and an increasingly small part of the solution. While generating support for preventive or crisis management efforts can be difficult, such initiatives are especially important to break the cycle of fragility and should be prioritized in areas where today's strategic investment can mitigate tomorrow's overwhelming crisis. Small amounts of financial support today can mean significant and meaningful security and justice sector reform, enhanced provision of essential services, reduce corruption, and franchise disengaged sectors of society, such as women, children, and minorities and make a difference. Second, we must recognize that we cannot do everything on our own, nor should we be expected to shoulder the bulk of the cost in blood or in treasure for countering violent extremism around the world on our own. As the Biden administration's interim national security strategic guidance states, recent events show all too clearly that many of the biggest threats we face respect no borders or walls and must be met with collective action. While critical, this will be no easy lift. U.S. counterterrorism agencies have developed very close working relationships with their counterparts, but broadening U.S. efforts to work by, with, and through allies and local partners around the world on military missions and even on diplomatic missions will be easier said than done, given America's recent track record of abandoning allies and local partners on short notice. More broadly, convincing partner nations to form sharing burden-sharing alliances with the United States to address threats closer to their borders than ours will uh, will be possible only once the United States has taken tangible action to restore its credibility as a reliable long-term partner and does more to tackle domestic violent extremism within its own borders. At the end of the day, one European official explained to me, all Europeans want a strong security partnership with the U.S. The question is whether this cooperation will be limited to the core missions, identifying and sharing information about terrorist networks, for example, or if we can move beyond this and together address the breeding grounds of terrorism and stabilization missions in places like Syria, Iraq, and the Sahel. The key to making the latter development more likely may come down to the U.S. revisiting its traditional reluctance to share decision-making with its European partners. We need to be better listeners and European partners revisiting their traditional discomfort over burden sharing. Two final but important port points. Ideological fluidity and blending of ideologies is what we see over and over here in the US and in Europe. Typically, we see people wanting a sense of purpose, of community, of belonging. These are the key motivators to radicalization, not ideology. Ideology comes in later as the factor that then mobilizes people to action. 
This means that countering global violent extremism cannot focus on any one type of ideology. Islamist extremism still poses terrorist threats that we will have to take seriously, no doubt. But here in the United States, domestic violent extremists, white supremacists, anti-government, neo-Nazis, and more present an even greater threat. Second, there'll always be areas of disagreement in the transatlantic relationship, and these will need to be navigated carefully. Some examples include, Europe will have to do better on repatriation of foreign terrorist fighter nationals. The situation in camps like Al-Hol in Syria is simply untenable. America is going to have to come to terms with the dangers posed by the spread of hate speech, disinformation, and terrorist content online and find ways to address this challenge within our First Amendment limits. We're going to have to find ways to think about the threat level and the appropriate response to extremist actors such as Lebanese Hezbollah, Iraq, and other Shia militants. And to do that, we're going to need creative solutions. So while, for example, pressing the European Union to designate all, all of Hezbollah is important and should continue, Congress could do a lot of good in this regard by working with national level parliaments in Europe, many of which are animated on this subject as well. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you uh, and uh, look forward to your questions. I'd like to thank all our witnesses for their statements, both uh, the comprehensive nature of dealing just with the tactical issues and the strategic issues that are involved. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be parts of the questions that go forward. Uh, I'm going to recognize members, sometimes uh, out of order of seniority, uh, given the fact we're in the midst of so many roll calls. Uh, and because of that virtual format, uh, I'll do it in a uh, basis of uh, a Democrat and a Republican alternating back and forth. Uh, when that is possible, uh, and we'll continue uh, doing this, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, to the conclusion of the hearing without interruption. Uh, each uh, member, uh, if you missed your turn, uh, let our staff know. We'll circle back to you, uh, and if you seek recognition, uh, you've got to unmute your microphone and address the chair uh, verbally for those that might be wandering into this room, a uh, few that they may be. So, uh, I'd like to now recognize represent Kathy Manning uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Keating. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, I am proud to co lead uh, ATRES 359, a bipartisan resolution I introduced with my colleague, Chairman Ted Deutsch, urging the European Union to fully designate Hezbollah in its entirety as a terrorist organization. And Mr. Levitt, you are an expert on the terrorist group Hezbollah. Do you believe any distinction can or should be made by any of our European allies between the so-called political and military wings of a terrorist group like Hezbollah? Thank you for your question. Uh, the simple way to answer it is, is not to ask me, but to ask Hezbollah leaders themselves, who have been very, very clear in the fact that there is no distinction to be made between the various wings of their organization. Even Europol's latest uh, terrorism uh, situation, a threat report, uh, makes this clear, that the uh, distinction that was made in 2013 undermines their ability to carry out investigations. There's a political issue going on here that's primarily driven by France. But that doesn't mean, on the one hand, that while we continue to pursue this issue with our colleagues, that we can't do other things. There's been some significant progress at national levels with different European countries doing different things. Some have passed designation authorities, some that don't have them have used immigration authorities or uh, authorities that enable them to ban certain symbols. And in each of these instances, what's driven these domestic actions has been, uh, in part, uh, actions within their parliaments. And I think, therefore, the U.S. Congress engagement, not only at the EU level, but at national European parliamentary levels, could be very effective in this regard. Thank you. Mr. Pantucci, there are many ways for us to work with our European allies and partners to exchange best practices to counter violent extremism and white supremacy. Can you talk to us about which has proven to be the most effective forum for us to cooperate to counter the global threat of white supremacy? Um, thank you uh, for the question. I think uh, at the moment, uh, the problem of white supremacy is one, or the extreme right wing is one that I think we're still trying to work out exactly where uh, the best forums uh, to deal with this are. Um, in part because we're still sort of trying to understand the exact parameters of the problem. 
Um, I think traditionally it's been something that's been the respite, uh, the, the, the remit of uh, police forces. Um, and I think police forces have traditionally been the ones at the front line of dealing with this. So increasingly, we've seen intelligence agencies moving into this space as well. Um, and that, you know, enhanced cooperation at that level is probably quite effective. But if I think about these groups and how they play out on the ground, um, I think trying to engage, frankly, at a policing level is probably a very good place to start because they are really, you know, these groups are quite diffuse. They're very much within our communities. They haven't necessarily got the same sorts of international links that you get from, you know, Islamist groups or other other ones. They are sort of developing some online communications, uh, but it really is something that I think police forces seem to be the ones who are dealing with uh, most effectively um, uh, so far. That's my sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mr. Anidi, the Transatlantic Alliance has faced significant challenges in recent years, uh, and more, more recently than that. Uh, however, our countries share a common challenge when it comes to combating misinformation online, especially social media. Uh, how can we work better together to counter the rapid spread of online extremist propaganda? Thank you. I would argue that uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, progress has actually been achieved uh, uh, on uh, uh, this uh, very uh, aspect. Uh, we uh, concentrated a few years ago on our differences. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, we had, you know, different constitutional model, different approach. Uh, uh, we would, in the EU, rather pursue a path uh, towards uh, hard legislation. Uh, in the US, rather voluntary uh, efforts. But all this was the past. What I've uh, uh, seen over the last months, I believe, uh, is a very, very strong recognition of uh, the absolute and vital importance uh, of uh, uh, requesting more from the different uh, uh, online platform and us as well being able to develop better tools to support them to better understand uh, also the type of ideological vehicles uh, that uh, uh, was uh, online and uh, also have uh, uh, better channels of uh, information uh, with them in order to notify uh, terrorist related uh, material. But also, as uh, um, Videa uh, said, not only identifying material that should be withdrawn, but work with uh, uh, the actors in order to identify people behind uh, these uh, uh, sorts of uh, content and also work more with them in order to promote counter messaging, uh, to promote uh, uh, actual uh, uh, material that would help uh, individuals uh, to see things in more objective ways. So I think we are on a good path, slightly different approaches still. We have hard legislation on, on this, uh, but we see that uh, uh, together we speak with a very strong uh, uh, voice uh, uh, towards the platforms. Thank you. And thank you to all of our witnesses and thank you to our chairman for holding such an important hearing. And I yield back. Thank you, Representative Manning. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Vice uh, Ranking Member uh, Joe Wilson from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, and uh, Chairman, thank you for your uh, leadership. Uh, Bill Keating does a good job trying to keep us in line. And so, um, uh, Dr. Levitt, um, last week the CIA Deputy Director acknowledged early reports of foreign fighters traveling to join Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Are we at risk of another outflow of foreign terrorist fighters from Europe? How can we work with our European partners to address this threat? Thank you, sir, for the question. I think it's important to note that while I'm very, very concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, uh, the withdrawal, how the withdrawal happened, I think we need to recognize that Afghanistan in 2021 is not Afghanistan in 2001, and that the counterterrorism measures that our European colleagues have put in place uh, border security, biometrics, et cetera, today are infinitely better than they were back then. I 
don't anticipate Afghanistan being a significant draw for Western foreign fighters, in part because they're already more attractive places to go in Syria and Iraq and other places. Um, but we're going to have to keep a close eye, maybe not on huge numbers, but on small numbers. And we're going to have to be worried about uh, terrorist groups not limited to Al Qaeda being able to enjoy safe haven. There are two issues in Afghanistan. One is the groups like Al Qaeda and the Haqqani network that will be able to operate in areas under Taliban control because they're close to the Taliban. But the vacuum created by the withdrawal is larger than the Taliban uh, can fill. And therefore, groups like Islamic State, Khorasan, ISK will be able to operate in those areas that are beyond Taliban control. So we're going to have a new problem set different than the one we've had before in Afghanistan. And we won't have the luxury of having the type of intelligence collection that we've relied on for the, in Afghanistan for the past 20 years. And <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Levitt, uh, also, on, sadly, with the reopening of training schools in Afghanistan for rogue suicide bombers, is the U.S. at risk of an attack uh, of equal impact to 9-11, um, whether at homeland or abroad? And if so, what type of attack would you anticipate? I think the likelihood of a terrorist spectacular attack like we suffered on 9-11 is much, much smaller now. Again, in part because of all of the different systems we have put in place, the counterterrorism infrastructure we have today is just so much different and better than it was 20 years ago. And also because we've put in place uh, the ability to collect information, to be able to forecast and anticipate. We can't do that quite as well as we want to yet in Afghanistan because we're not on the ground. Uh, but I think that the most immediate threats will be in Afghanistan and in the region around Afghanistan before it will come to our shores or to our interests abroad. Over the medium to long term, there is that possibility, but we have time to mitigate that threat. And with your uh, expertise and background on Hezbollah, what is the current threat that Hezbollah poses to Europe? Hezbollah primarily poses a uh, logistics and financing threat in Europe. Uh, but as the State Department uh, revealed just a few months ago, Hezbollah has been moving ammonium nitrate uh, material to be used to uh, put together explosives through several European countries over the past uh, few years. And as we saw in Burgas, Bulgaria, uh, a successful attack, and in Cyprus, two thwarted attacks, uh, Hezbollah is not shy about operating in Europe when it suits its interests. To the extent that we recognize that ideology is not the issue we should be dealing with primarily, we should be dealing with extremism across ideologies. That means we should not be limited to Sunni extremism. We should be covering Shia extremism. We should not be limiting ourselves to Islamist extremism. We certainly need to be focusing on white supremacists and other types of domestic violent extremism. And I, I, I really am back again on uh, risk uh, at home. I, I'm very, very concerned about a, uh, a rogue suicide bomber uh, coming to say a football stadium uh, and the panic that would occur. Uh, where they don't have to kill that many people, but the panic would be uh, incredibly um, horrific. Uh, and then, uh, sadly to me, um, the development of drones, uh, as we saw with the swarm of drones uh, that Iran provided against the uh, oil refinery in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it, it is so easy to um, purchase at a convenience store drones. Um, how do we address that, that it, uh, attacking public buildings um, uh, legislative buildings uh, within the United States? These are both excellent questions. I think that the issue of suicide attacks in the United States is increasingly one, like other types of attacks, that is more likely to happen by homegrown violent extremists, including people who are not even foreign directed. The issue of drones is beyond my expertise right here and now, leave it and suffice it to say that the issue of dealing with terrorist access to simple technologies that they're able to exploit to tremendous benefit is of real concern to many different parts of the US government, though most of the drones that can be bought at Walmart are not the type that can cause significant damage, for example, to Congress. It is a huge problem. Well, thank you, Ben, very much for all of your participation. I'm honored again to be here with uh, Chairman Keating. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, chair now recognizes Representative Dean Phillips, Minnesota, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, greetings to our witnesses and uh, gratitude for uh, being with us. I think it's fair to say that 
the United States and European nations take different approaches to protecting speech uh, and to regulating online content, uh, but we clearly are all facing uh, the challenge of hate, uh, disinformation, and misinformation spread online. So, Ms. Ramalingam, uh, if you could start by sharing with us how you would characterize the most urgent needs uh, for transatlantic cooperation uh, relative to countering uh, the spread of uh, propaganda and radicalizing. Uh, messages and content online. Thank you for your question, Congressman. Um, and you know, as a as an organization that operates both in in Europe and the United States, we obviously firmly believe in and safeguard First Amendment protections. But of course, the the regulations in in Europe are different, and you know, the tech companies' obligations to um, to moderate content are are different based on the country that you're in. As an organization that operates across across that transatlantic Atlantic divide, our approach is not necessarily focused on removal of content, but ensuring that there are safer alternatives online. So this is not about um, cooperation, of, you know, and and, uh, and accountability for the tech companies. It's not just about that. It's about ensuring that we're using these digital platforms to their full advantage to signpost to individuals who are at risk who are demonstrating their vulner vulnerabilities online that there are there are options for their, them to exit. There's a raft of evidence of evidence that has been growing over the last several years, demonstrating that if you engage these individuals online, if you start conversations with them, if you seek to channel them into support programs, they are actually disproportionately likely to engage with those offers as compared to the general public. So there's more work we need to do to take the offline terrorism prevention infrastructures that we've built and ensure that those same practitioners have the digital li literacy and the capability to begin to engage online. And that, that means everything from you know, ensuring that we can assess risk online and that we translate the way that we assess vulnerability offline into the online space, but also ensuring that we can kind of man manage that channeling of individuals from the online space into offline support programs. Okay, so, so it's your argument and belief that uh, that is the mechanism that we should be looking to and you're convinced that it will work and is working? I'm convinced that in the 21st century, there, there cannot be any offline terrorism prevention program that does not have that engagement online. There is no longer a divide between the offline and the online space. We all live our lives in both worlds. And so if we're going to be effective in our fight against terrorism, we have to be reaching out to those communities online. It can't just be about removing content. You remove the post, you remove the account, but that person still exists and still poses a threat to our communities. Okay, so good old fashioned intervention, I understand. Uh, Mr. Levitt, a uh, similar question to you. How can governments on, on both sides of the Atlantic play a more intentional and energetic role in uh, defeating the appetite for uh, radicalization and extremist uh, messages? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think that the way to deal with this, the only way to deal with this is to be very local and to recognize that to stop people from having a cognitive opening to dangerous ideas to means to to uh, make sure that they are a part of a functioning society. And I don't mean on a, on a huge, I mean in their neighborhood, I mean in their community. Can they access services? Uh, do they feel like they belong to something? Do they feel that they are contributing to something? Ultimately, some of the most important, some of the most critical things that we can do to reduce extremism are not going to be part of the security realm and shouldn't be securitized to borrow a phrase that our European uh, allies have been using for a long time. We should be doing those things for the right reason because good governance is really important, because rule of law is really important, because anti-corruption is really important. And we should recognize that doing those will have tremendous security benefits. But that means that when we step back and say, how do we stop the terrorist threat? A lot of our dollars should be going into clinical social workers, community programs, because that will not today, not tomorrow, and it will be difficult, therefore, for your, you know, uh, metrics and evaluation programs, but they will, over time, contribute to a healthier society that is not as amenable to, is not looking for more radical answers to complicated questions. And are there some examples of governments already collaborating to that end? There are many examples. There are many examples where governments have started programs like this and then politicians got wind of them and shut them down because politicians want tend to want to know how is the money I'm investing going to be spent and show me it's going to work. And I have to tell you, we in the United States don't have much of a culture of, of, of trial and error um, that's seen as political risk. 
And I give our European colleagues, even when they have failed, tremendous credit for trying and failing. People tend to put, it. I'll stop there, thank I, you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, look, my time's expired and I wanna afford it to my colleagues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levitt, uh, uh, Dr. Levitt, and to all our witnesses, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, Mr. Pfluger, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for uh, organizing this. Everything I learned about counterterrorism, I learned from uh, Dr. Matthew Levitt uh, as, a, as a former colleague at the Washington Institute. Uh, I'll, I'll focus my questions on a couple of things uh, uh, that you mentioned and, and thank you to all the the entire panel for, for talking about this uh, important issue. But um, Matt, what, what, when it comes to the relationships, you kind of mentioned some of the uh, the fallout from the relationships uh, that we have transatlantic partnerships and relationships to prevent terrorism. I mean, where, if you could name, you know, two or three that, that we really should focus on, I mean, where, where did, where do you think the impact of the Afghanistan withdrawal is going to, to hurt us the most, which relationships should we focus on the most in the short term that have the biggest impact on counterterrorism? First of all, I cannot tell you how much pleasure it gives me to refer to you, sir, as Congressman Fluger. It was a real honor to have you here as a military fellow at the Washington Institute before you took a turn to politics. Great to see you. Uh, I, however, take no responsibility for whatever you know about terrorism. Uh, I, I think the Afghanistan bit has to be uh, divided into to two baskets uh, that both come down to um, renewing our uh, reliability as a partner. Um, and when I think of partnerships, I think of partnerships with allies, so alliances, the EU, European member states, others around the world. And I think of, of partnerships, uh, the way we had partners on the ground in Afghanistan, the way we have partners on the ground in Iraq, the way we have partners on the ground in Syria. Uh, if I were a U.S. partner on the ground, uh, say, in the Kurdish areas of Iraq or in North East Syria, I'd be really worried today about the staying power of the United States. I'd be worried about whether I needed to have some type of backup plan. Um, and whether you're in favor of the U.S. having withdrawn from Afghanistan or not, whether you think the way it was done was good or not, I think this is something we can all agree on. The reality is those types of partners are raising eyebrows and I've had conversations with people like that. It, this is this is happening. And the second one is with our allies. Uh, it wasn't just the United States that found itself struggling to get its people and its allies out. And US military and intelligence agencies did Herculean efforts getting people out in the small amount of space, but we left our allies in the exact same position um, very suddenly. And it wasn't the first time. Uh, I was in a European capital that December when President Trump first tweeted out, we're out of Syria. And they were really worried and really scared. They had people deployed in Syria, forward deployed with us, based on the ability to rely on our presence. And they got no forewarning. And we need to do better in terms of communicating with our allies. As a former US official, I know we tend to walk into a room and tell people how it is and how we want it to be. We need to start walking into a room and start asking, how do you see the threat? How do you see the problem? And we'll get to how we see it and trying to bridge those uh, gaps where they exist. But I think we need to be better listeners. Well, thank you for, for that. Um, let me switch gears just a little bit and ask you a question about uh, one of the things that, uh, that that I believe I learned uh, in my fellowship, uh, which was kind of the way that the the Iranian government, um, whether it's IRGC, Cuts Force, or or other uh, aspects of it, will react when it comes to Qasem Soleimani. What sort of retaliation should we be expecting? Has that threat increased? Where, I mean, if you had the the crystal ball, you know, where should we be looking, and how should we be? focusing our, our attentions to prevent, uh, you know, some sort of you know, really bad uh, retaliatory attack. I, I lack that crystal ball, but I will say this. Uh, I do think that while very aggressive, taking out Qasem Soleimani ultimately led to greater international security. Um, I think that it's telling that the Shia extremists, uh, Iranian operatives and Iran's proxies uh, have not responded in a uh, massive international terrorist attack kind of way. Of course, they shot rockets at our at our soldiers, which is no small matter. But they also have a very long memory, and I think that they are uh, patient. The primary thing they want more than anything else as a legacy of Qasem Soleimani is to kick us out of the region, out of Iraq in particular. 
Um, but I do think that we have to be very, very careful. Uh, the same way Lebanese Hezbollah has not forgotten the uh, operation that took out arch terrorist Imad Mugniam in 2008. Uh, the Iranians are not going to soon forget the loss of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mario Mohandas, the Iraqi is Iraqi deputy. Uh, and so I think that it's safe to say that the U.S. intelligence and security communities have been very, very focused on this for quite some time. Well, thank you. I think my time has expired. Please pass uh, my very best to the entire uh, Washington Institute. Thank you for your uh, time here and, and all the panelists. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fluger. Mr. Schneider, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to all, all the witnesses, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your perspectives here. Um, like Mr. Luger, I will echo that uh, much of what I've learned, if not all of what I've learned, is from Matt Levitt and uh, in support of the, uh, the Washington Institute as well. But um, Dr. Levitt, I want to uh, turn to you with, with, I have a couple questions. The first one deals with Hezbollah. We've talked a lot in your written testimony. You talked about Hezbollah offering a Caton Point and navigating complicated matters. Uh, across borders. Seven years ago, we worked together on drafting the Hezbollah International Finance and Prevention Act. It's had great effect in, in um, uh, limiting Hezbollah's reach, but they've been working to get, get around it. What would you suggest as specific actions we might take alone in the U.S., in conjunction with our partners, to um, update HIPAA to do more to, to block Hezbollah in their efforts? Uh, thank you for the question. And Tremendous pressure, everybody's saying, putting it all on me. But uh, um, look, HIFA did a lot of things that I think a lot of people don't understand. Uh, the Lebanese Central Bank issued a circular after the Hezbollah International Finance Prevention Act was passed, instructing banks that they had to follow these, these regulations. It had a real impact on Hezbollah's ability to bank. Um, Hezbollah started storing money, more of the money that used to store in Lebanon elsewhere, but it didn't uh, change Hezbollah's overall financial position in Lebanon. And in fact, while Hezbollah is not solely to blame by any stretch of the imagination for the financial and political implosion in Lebanon, it is one responsible actor. And one of the issues is the illicit financial activities that Hezbollah was engaged in through the banks. My colleague Hanin Radar just wrote a piece that was published yesterday arguing that one of the things we need to do is work more closely uh, with the private sector and the NGO sector uh, in Lebanon as the political, business, and finance sectors are collapsing in Lebanon. Uh, we cannot allow the one last standing actor by default because it gets so much money from Iran to be Hezbollah at a time when, ironically, Hezbollah's political standing is actually falling. So. Lebanon presents a very, very difficult problem, but I think one of the areas where we in the Europeans disagree is would a designation mean that Europeans wouldn't be able to have political influence and sway in Lebanon? And I think the fact that the United States has designated all of Hezbollah for a very long time, and we clearly have a lot of influence and sway in Lebanon, means that you can. Great. Thank, thank you for that. And I agree we, we have to do more, and, and we will. Um, shifting gears a little bit, also in your written testimony, you say, finally, America must address this domestic terrorism problem, which uh, the FBI director uh, was on the Hill this week talking about uh, the significant growth we've seen in that. Uh, we have legislation that I've introduced with colleagues, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, that would seek to do that. But I was hoping you could touch on, on the importance of bolstering our, our domestic efforts uh, law enforcement, intelligence, uh, et cetera, uh, but also coordinating with our international allies and working with them to ensure that uh, the U.S. isn't a expo net exporter of domestic terrorism, white supremacist ideologies. I think we first need to recognize that in, for many of our allies abroad, they really do feel that we have become a net exporter of, of violent white supremacist extremism, uh, and, we, and we need to get on top of that. Um, there are lots of ways to do that, and I don't have a particular, you know, think this is exactly how to do it. I do think that we need to have some type of legislation that makes it clear to everybody that neo-Nazi or white supremacists or anti-government militia, that when they carry out acts that are, that fit the definition of terrorism, that is terrorism. So that, for example, Muslim Americans don't say, well, when someone from our community does this act, it's terrorism. When someone from another community does the exact same act, it's not. We, we need to, we need to fix that. But if you even just want to use kind of uh, state or existing federal regulations, we have lots of regulations to deal with almost all types of terrorist activity with the glaring, glaring exception of mass shooter attacks, uh, which cannot be for technical legal reasons described as an act of terrorism right now. 
And I do think that we need to do a lot more within Second Amendment protections to address the fact that guns make terrorism more dangerous in this country. Well, thank you. And you make an important point. We um, we do have the statutes on the books to uh, uh, tackle terrorism on the one hand, but I, I believe we need to, as the DTPA, Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act does, enhance uh, our, our law enforcement working with, in this case, Department of Justice, uh, FBI, and, and Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and with that, I'm, I, I'm running out of time, so I'll yield back. Thank you all again. Uh, this is an issue we have to address with with urgency, but also with across borders working with our allies. I, I thank the witnesses. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Representative Schneider. Uh, chair now recognizes Representative uh, Meyer from Michigan. For five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to our panelists who are here today. Uh, I think this is a really important topic for us to be discussing. And so I really appreciate that we are taking time uh, to better understand that transatlantic component uh, on our global uh, terrorism and, and just global security mindset here. So uh, I guess, Mr. Levitt, I have a question for you. Um, you know, you mentioned that the way in which the U.S. has been disengaging from our conflicts, uh, and I, we've seen this in Afghanistan, how that is really offering opportunities for uh, global jihadist elements to seize upon uh, the propaganda victory and, and boost their own morale. Uh, as we look to rebalance and focus more on great power conflicts away from the post 9-11 conflicts, you know, how in your mind do we end those engagements in ways that do not offer uh, strong upside for uh, jihadist elements? Thank you, sir, for the question. A, a lot of it has to do with the how, not the what. Um, and I think we need to recognize that, by the way, it, it's not just Sunni extremists, it's Shia extremists, and it's not just Islamist extremists, it's white supremacists that are looking at, uh, if you follow them online, looking at what, what, the way things went down in Afghanistan and saying, look, maybe America's a paper tiger and you just got to wait them out and we can do this. And this has been a boon, uh, a shot in the arm for uh, the wide array of of um, ideologies. Um, I think the most important thing, which is the core of this hearing, is how we go about working with allies to do this. When our allies are deployed with us, when they are at risk, when they are putting themselves at risk, we need to keep them completely in the loop. Maybe even ask their opinions on how to go about doing it, rather than leave them in a situation where they're kind of left holding the hot potato. Um, and, and we've done this now several times over at least, let's say, two administrations. Um, if we're going to ask our allies to step up and put themselves in harm's way, then we have to treat them as full partners when it comes to making big decisions that are going to affect their security. And speaking of that, and I know um, there's obviously been a recent rift with France over uh, some procurement and the Australia, UK, US alliance that was formed. But also recently, President Macron had mentioned concerns about uh, the ease of access that especially Middle Eastern based um, terrorists moving into the Shenzhen zone and France very much being a magnet for many of those attacks uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but he had expressed that concern and that the, the the European Union and members of the Shenzhen zone may me, need to undertake and, and bolster their their border monitoring and other components. Um, you know, do you see the U.S. as having a role in in that type of monitoring and those transnational flows? Uh, it's speaking on the alliance front and in general, I'm curious your thoughts on you know how you see our European allies uh, trying to better bolster their own domestic security. Well, sir, I'm gonna. Uh, um, I'm going to be the last uh, quote unquote expert in Washington to tell you where his uh, expertise ends and mine ends at submarines. So I, I won't comment on the current uh, uh, flare up between the US and France. Uh, but I do think that one area where the US and our European par par uh, allies partners have had tremendous cooperation and Olivier can speak to this firsthand. This is his, one of his many areas of expertise is on this very issue, whether it's biometrics or information sharing, whether it's pairing up um, FBI, not only with Interpol, but specifically with Europol, 
the abil the things that they've been able to do together in specific investigations of all different types and in shoring up the borders has been really tremendous. I do think they're going to have to find ways to backfill behind the types of intelligence we used to have coming out of Afghanistan that we're not going to have anymore. We're not going to go dark. We're going to go dark gray, um, and they'll find ways to fill that in. Um, but I think that that's something actually that is a success story and that will continue. Thank you. I appreciate uh, those responses. And Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Representative. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Cicilline from Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Joyce and Chairman Keating and our ranking members, Wilson and Fitzpatrick, for this really important hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for uh, your testimony. Um, as you all know, less than two weeks ago, we commemorated the anniversary of September 11th, and it's a reminder of our ongoing responsibility to protect our country from acts of terrorism. And I think, you know, we've learned a lot, but I think we all recognize that terrorism continues to present itself in increasingly complicated ways and in new places. And the digital age in particular has allowed us all to be more interconnected than ever, but also and led to great global cooperation and economic uh, relationships, but it's also really in many ways tested our counterterrorism capabilities, as we've seen that misinformation can quickly lead to radicalization online. And so Ms. Uh, Ramalingam, um, you mentioned five or six components of various European models in combating radicalization and extremism. I assume that there's no reason to conclude that the same elements ought to be present in uh, models that we create here in the United States. And, and, and in addition to that, are there any other lessons we should take from those examples? Thank you, Congressman. I, I do believe that all of those points apply here in the United States. In particular, our terrorism prevention mechanisms need to be locally driven. And this is this is the case whether we're talking about the jihadist threat or whether we're talking about white nationalism. It needs to be locally driven, locally based. It needs to have federal support, but also local government support. And in particular, we need to draw on the existing suite of local practitioners, licensed practitioners, who have the capabilities to have conversations with people at risk. This is not necessarily about setting up dedicated programs to, to counter uh, jihadism or to counter white supremacy. We need to be building on those existing state frameworks and resources. There is going to be some training, some capacity building that needs to be done for those practitioners to get comfortable with dealing with, with cases that, you know, with individuals who are presenting these kinds of ideologies. But as, as I've mentioned and others on the panel have mentioned, this isn't necessarily an ideological battle. This is fundamentally about dealing with those underlying drivers and the solution is going to be local. So if there's one takeaway from those messages that I, that I shared in my earlier testimony, it's about supporting at the local level the development of these kinds of prevention infrastructures. Thank you. And with respect to the role of the social media platforms, which we see, you know, that kind of what has changed is how quickly, you know, millions of people can be reached with um, completely false information that can assist in the accelerating radicalization. Are there specific actions that social media platforms can or should take to help counter radicalization online? What are those? And then secondly, are there specific actions we should take as the government to help regulate the spread of misinformation and radicalization on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter? And if you could start, Ms. Ramalagam, and then I'd like to hear Mr. Um, Onidi, uh, could he also respond to that? Sure, happy to start. Um, so we know that deplatforming works. There's a huge amount of evidence to show that. Um, an example, jihadists operating online have really struggled to rebuild their networks after the 2019 Telegram takedown. There's many other cases here. So deplatforming works and the tech companies need to be doing more of that. But in order to effectively deal with terrorist abuse on these platforms and abuse by disinformation actors, we need to accept that there will always be content that falls into the gray zone and will not be liable for removal. And there will always be some spaces on these platforms platforms that are not liable for moderation. So for these cases, in addition to moderation efforts, and I can't emphasize enough that tech companies need to do better on moderation, but in addition to that, the tech companies are in a unique position to offer safer alternatives to users who might be at risk of getting involved. This is a model that those companies regularly adopt in the suicide prevention space, um, in the child sexual exploitation space. They should be adopting similar safeguarding measures with audiences at risk of violent extremism and disinformation. Um, and I'll, I'll hand over to to Olivier. I very much concur with the, with this analysis. I think 
the, the first most important point was uh, uh, for all of us, and, uh, American actors and European actors, to actually get uh, all these uh, uh, platforms to recognize that there was a problem, to recognize that they had uh, uh, part of a responsibility in uh, uh, this problem, and also to recognize that some of the choices they make, some of their commercial choices, uh, uh, but also some of their technical choices, does actually sometimes lead to dreadful negative effects. I take a few examples. The first one, this quest uh, uh, for uh, introducing uh, systematic end-to-end -end encryption. This is very challenging. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we want uh, uh, to protect the privacy of private communications, but uh, uh, if uh, pr encryption uh, does lead uh, for uh, law enforcement uh, and uh, uh, others uh, to be blind in uh, the actual communication that is uh, being spread across uh, networks, uh, this is the limit of what can be accepted. And then this is the ma a major challenge uh, we are uh, now dealing with uh, in uh, the European Union. Second example, the type of commercially oriented uh, um, algorithm that are being used. Uh, there is also there quite a number of dreadful negative effects in the way those algorithms amplify the quest and the access to uh, negative and dreadful material. And th these are some of uh, the uh, work that we are conducting with them in order for them to be better at self-correcting some of the mistakes they uh, are doing. And then finally, I think ultimately it is uh, uh, also for us public authorities to progressively set obligations uh, uh, on uh, the platforms, obligations to be good citizens, obligations to recognize that uh, because of the very negative uh, uh, effects some uh, content can have, uh, they should also be part of providing some uh, uh, corrective measures. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Chair now recognizes. Uh, Representative Wild from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for um, Mr. Needy, and spe specifically following the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, where I am right now, all of us are, and um, we know that uh, an individual in France transferred something like $500,000 in Bitcoin to one of the extremists who was involved in the insurrection. Uh, before then dying by by suicide, the person who transferred the, the Bitcoin. Has there been any investigation by the EU into that transfer? And can you tell us about it? I, I don't know uh, about this case in particular, but I can tell you that uh, what happened came as a shock to all, all of us. Uh, it did also uh, confirm very much that uh, work that we had initiated uh, uh, across the Atlantic to actually broaden the kind of understanding of different motivations, uh, uh, different forms uh, of ideologies being spread in order to incite uh, to violent uh, uh, extremism uh, behavior was actually the right uh, way to pursue. And uh, given the very intrinsic uh, cooperation between investigators on both sides, I am sure that uh, if uh, this uh, uh, transfer has been uh, uh, monitored, uh, this is being examined now by the relevant uh, uh, law enforcement agencies on both sides. But you don't know this, any details about that? This, this particular case, no, I, I really apologize. Okay. No, that, that's quite all right. But following up on what you just said, um, what can you tell us about the uh, parallels or the um, interconnectedness between the white supremacists, um, the neo-Nazis, uh, other extreme organizations um, on both sides of the Atlantic and how we can work together to um, best uh, combat it? This is at the heart of uh, uh, what uh, we are working on uh, uh, for the moment. We, we're trying, the difficulty with these uh, uh, individuals are that uh, they do not necessarily, uh, they are not necessarily very outspoken as to the type of organizations they are members of. 
they use also uh, extremely sophisticated ways of uh, uh, communication. So the first uh, uh, endeavor we are confronted with is to try to identify beyond the individuals the type of networks, the type of organizations they are members of. And from that, uh, uh, try to see to what extent uh, those organizations have actually international uh, connections. In a number of cases, we have seen uh, that uh, uh, there are uh, physical travel patterns, that there are uh, communication patterns between different organizations uh, uh, known under different names as well, which again incite us to uh, work even more on uh, uh, these because what we would like to be able to do is, uh, uh, as we have done with known uh, uh, terrorism uh, groupings, ultimately is to identify those organizations, designate those organizations as terrorist organizations in order then to be able to uh, also apply all the sanctions that are associated and, and uh, that are at our disposal from uh, our legislative uh, frameworks access to find, deny access to finance, and uh, uh, deny access to, to traveling and so on. It is challenging because those are really new forms uh, uh, of working together, but it is really at the heart of what we're doing for the moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can't see the clock. I, I assume I'm out of time. Another uh, minute. You'd like. All right. Well, I, then I will follow up, Mr. Oniti. You know, one of my, the concerns that I have about uh, what's happening here in the United States is actually there's a parallel in, in Europe as well, um, and that is increasing um, public discourse by elected officials that I believe feeds into um, this kind of domestic terrorism, whether it's here in the United States or, or in the EU. Um, it, can you comment on that and 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 what the role is of these um, these kinds of public statements by people who should be leading by example but are not? Well, I mean, we 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 are very attached also to freedom of speech on the, on this side. So I think we we have uh, we have uh, somewhat of the same uh, uh, very strong uh, values in terms of uh, uh, protecting. Uh, freedom of uh, of expressions. Uh, what what we're trying to do is uh, try to demonstrate uh, what kind of behavior, what kind of incitement uh, uh, coming from whoever uh, is it uh, uh, from a political uh, uh, individual? Is it uh, in the context uh, of other uh, individual? So that we can actually take action. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, we uh, have uh, ways, uh, uh, also criminal ways, to pursue when we have evidence of uh, uh, incitement uh, for hatred uh, and, and so on. But it's a very, very difficult field. But again, uh, it's a lot of research trying to understand where this incitement uh, uh, comes from, whether it is uh, uh, from an organization, from a public uh, uh, also opinion leaders, uh, many opinion leaders are also inciting to uh, conduct a number of, uh, of, uh, of aspects. Uh, it's part of the work uh, we, are, we are doing in order to better understand the different factors and manifestations of this. Thank you very much. With Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you for your questions. Chair recognizes uh, Representative Ted Liu from California for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Keating. I want to thank Chairman Deutsch as well for holding this important joint hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses. I have a, a question for uh, Mr. Levitt first about governmental programs you thought could terrorism. Now, I'm a Democrat. I support governmental programs. Come out of Skid Row in Los Angeles. I think we've uh, we, you got Latinos and African Americans. It's not like you're seeing a surge of terrorists coming from the Latino African American. Representative Lou, I think we're having some technical problems. Uh, let's pause and. Uh, you can take back some of your time, see if uh, they correct themselves. Otherwise, we can come back. Let's 
Give it another try. This is Representative Lou. Uh, come back to Representative Lou and work out the technical problems. In the meantime, the chair recognizes for five minutes the chair uh, of the Transatlantic uh, Legislators Dialogue, uh, Representative Jim Costa from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding an important uh, subcommittee hearing on, on issues that are affecting all of us, both in the United States and Europe. Um, I'd like to address my first question to uh, Mr. Uh, Anducci. Um, the European Commissioner uh, Breton said yesterday that there's a growing feeling in Europe uh, that something is broken in our transatlantic re uh, relations as the chair of the transatlantic legislators dialogue and I work with Chairman Keating and many other members. We meet uh, regularly between um, ourselves and the European Union um, and we're concerned. Obviously, it's been a tough last four years and the president came to Europe in June and said, we're back. The recent US, UK, Australian agreement known as uh, AUKUS has obviously been very disturbing to our longtime ally, France, uh, a critical transatlantic partner. What effect, if any, uh, do we expect this agreement will have on our joint US EU ability uh, to counter new and rising terrorism? Is this something that we can I know there was a conversation with uh, President McCollum and, and President Biden uh, yesterday, but I'd like your 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 assessment of it. Um, well, I think okay. what uh, Mr. Panduzzi. Okay. Yes. I, I sorry. I thought it was directed to me. I wasn't sure that. Uh, thank you uh, for that question, uh, Chair. I think um, my uh, response would be that. Um, I think we're seeing a moment in transatlantic relations where, in particular in France, um, you've had a lot of anger in response to the agreement between Australia, the US and UK. Um, it was a very big deal from their perspective. The uh, announcement of this agreement landed the day before the European Commission was launching its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, so it landed a particularly bad moment for Brussels and it landed a particularly bad moment for France in particular, who was ultimately the sort of biggest loser from this uh, particular engagement. So what do we need to do to repair things? I mean, I, I, I've said, and, and you know, the, the partnership that goes back uh, post World War II uh, is now, uh, I think, a reflection, this relationship of the longest peacetime period in Europe in over 1000 years. You know, trust is takes a while to develop. I think we've developed it, but certainly in the last four years, there's been a lot of, of my European friends who are wondering, you know, can we still count on America? I think as uh, was pointed out by other speakers, I think the key is the United States needs to telegraph its messaging a little bit more clearly. I think maybe in Washington, this was felt to be understood, but obviously it wasn't understood in Europe. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, rebuilding the relationship is saying we'll just take communication and time. I think though fundamentally the transatlantic alliance remains for both sides the sort of bedrock of their strategic security outlooks no so I, I feel agree. in the longer term it will always yeah. come together my time's getting out i, I like uh mr um, um or, or ms i'm sorry R romelin um i don't know that i pronounced that properly but your um your um copy on moonshot i was interested in uh, you've done a lot in terms of intergovernmental uh, project on far-right terrorism in Europe. Uh, recently, uh, we've seen a situation in a number of European countries, um, um, as including Portugal, where the Chega party won nearly 12% of the vote in 2021. Uh, how does the US and the EU work together to counteract right-wing terrorism, social media, and all the impacts that are undermining, I think, our basic Western democracies are attempting to undermine them. Thank you, Congressman, and, um, and your pronunciation was just fine. Thank you. Um, it, the U.S. has a lot to learn, actually, from our European partners around prevention of right-wing terrorism, white nationalist terrorism. This is a threat and a problem set that European governments have been dealing with since since prior to 9/11, um, and so many of the the infrastructure 
infrastructures that were developed to deal with uh, white supremacy in Europe have now well over 20 years of an evidence base ar around you know, me methods of prevention that are going to be most effective. In um, Germany, some learnings, and Denmark, and a number of countries, yes. Absolutely, yes. Germany and Sweden in particular had some of the largest volumes of neo-Nazis dating back to the 1990s. And so there's you know, evidence around programs that were set up both by law enforcement, government, and by NGOs, um, which we can build on in our own terrorism prevention mechanisms. So I think one of our, one of our main priorities here needs to be learning, uh, listening to you know, what has been effective in Europe and looking at how those models might apply here in the United States. Do you believe that's being done now? I believe that's being started. Uh, I believe we've, we've just started listening and we've started that, that process of recognition that we can learn, that America can learn um, and doesn't necessarily need to um, be trialing new methods, but learning from the past. I think that recognition is there, but there's far more that needs to be done. Well, my time's expired, but Mr. Chairman, in our next TLD meeting in December, uh, we should maybe make this uh, a part of the agenda and I'm hoping uh, we're gonna be able to work our schedule so that we can make that work. But thank you again, thank the witnesses, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this important hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Costa. Uh, Mr. Liu, you're recognized uh, if the technology permits. Hi, Chairman George, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Deutsch and Chairman Keating for holding this important hearing. I have a question uh, first for Mr. Levitt. You earlier had mentioned about governmental programs uh, that could help um, connect people to the community and help reduce the threat of terrorism. I'm a Democrat. I, I support governmental programs. Uh, but what I see is, you know, we have, for example, Skid Row, a lot of poor homeless folks, but we don't see a surge of terrorism from folks coming out of Skid Row. We also have high poverty rates across America, particularly among Latino African Americans, but we're not seeing a surge of terrorists uh, who are African American Latinos. I'm just curious, uh, what governmental programs are you referring to and have they been shown to, to work? Thank you for the question, Congressman Liu. You're absolutely right. We should take a step back and note that this is uh, not a problem that's affecting you know, the vast majority of society. Terrorism is an outsized problem because very, very few cases of radicalization can lead to very, very outsized uh, outcomes. And it's not the case that you'll have, you know, everything is fine in one community, but there are problems in another. Every community will have people, because we're all individuals, we're all human, who in the, even in the same circumstances or very parallel circumstances will respond differently. And what we need to do, I believe, is make sure that everybody in that community is able to access the things we need to, to get by, not only food and education and housing, but purpose and belonging. And that's going to be different for every different person. Um, I, I think, for example, uh, now that there are going to be some significant military drawdowns as we uh, rethink the U.S. counterterrorism posture, specifically the military posture, we should anticipate that we're going to be having lots of servicemen, lots of servicewomen coming home the vast majority are going to reintegrate into society fairly easily. Some are going to need some help and some are going to be looking for that camaraderie and that purpose, and they're going to find it with an extremist milieu. So the type of programs I'm talking about, I, I, I'm not, I can't point you to a specific program. I think it has to be local government. It should not be a federal effort. Federally, we need to come up with monies to be able to empower programs at a local level to make sure that they're not communities that are disenfranchised. In, in, in Minneapolis, we realized that at some point within segments, not the whole, but within segments of the Somali American community, there were pockets of extremism because they lacked these types of belonging and purpose. When we had three different um, um, uh, pro, uh, pilot projects in Minneapolis and LA and Boston, they found very, very different phenomena in each of those locations across the United States. So we need to be very locally driven. Thank you. And then my next question is for the panel. I'm curious what you think about the impact of race uh, on terrorism. When you look at January 6, uh, the folks there based on Washington Post study showed that they were there. The greatest predictor was based on the rate of change in their county if it was declining in the white population. And if that was happening, 
uh, then they will more likely show up on January 6. And I'm just sort of curious what folks see in terms of is race playing a bigger role uh, now than it used to be in terms of terrorism? Um, I, I think it was addressed to the whole crowd, the whole panel, so maybe I'll offer my uh, two cents. I think that race is clearly a major driver of the kind of extreme right threat that we see that has become more prominent recently. What I would say is it's always been an issue, actually, on both sides of the coin. Um, if I think back to in the United Kingdom, if we think about questions of race, and you look at some of the early individuals who were sort of joining Al-Qaeda and who were going to training camps in Afghanistan in the sort of 1990s and early 2000s, um, a lot of them will report an experience of, you know, there are South Asian Britons living in the United Kingdom. Race was an issue that was sort of aggravating them and making them feel disenfranchised to their community and making them look to some sort of explanation, some sort of group that would give them a sense of membership that then would lead them to ultimately, in some cases, join Al Qaeda. So I think the question of race has been a sort of constant in many ways across all groups. And it's really about people feeling alienated from their environment. Um, and that is something which clearly generates problems. So yes, it, it's really part about, it's about social fabric and social tensions. And if that social tensions are very high, then the fabric of society gets very aggravated and torn. And that's what ultimately leads people to look for sort of extremist groups um, to help them understand the world and then to get them a frame to react to it within. Um, so I think it's really about the social fabric and tensions uh, that really, uh, you know, that race is clearly one of the uh, major issues that, um, that gets picked at. Uh, thank you, and uh, I can't actually see the time. Do I have any time left? Um, well, I'll give you, uh, why don't you take another 20 or 30 seconds, Representative? Because I'm I'll, so I'll just, slow. Uh, I was so slow with the switch. Right. <laughs> so thank you again for the panel. I just want to push back a little bit about folks who said that um, our allies are surprised by what the U.S. did. I just have to say, the former president campaigned on getting us out of endless wars, on getting us out of Syria, getting us out of Afghanistan, no one should be surprised. Biden also campaigned on that. So I don't know why our allies are surprised. Joe Biden was simply executing the withdrawal agreement that Trump signed last year. Trump reduced our troops from a high of over 15,000 down to 2,500. Biden completed the withdrawal. None of our allies should be surprised. The US is simply not gonna go engage in 20 years and fight a war merely for the purpose of trying to eliminate some terrorism. We're not going to do that anymore. No one should be surprised by that. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I'll now recognize uh, Chairman Deutsch, who's been uh, terrific to have somehow pulled this off. Uh, if we could coordinate some of our strategies as well as uh, we overcame some of the challenges of this hearing, uh, we'd be in great shape. But thank you again for your leadership uh, and for uh, chairing this uh, with our subcommittee. Uh, and I now recognize uh, Chairman Ted Deutsch. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, Ms. Ronald Lingham, the transatlantic relationship, uh, the alliance has experienced significant challenges in recent years. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, though many members are currently um, and uh, um, common throughout so many of the members, as the experience of internal struggles related to hate and extremism and the social media uh, misinformation that fuels it. Uh, how, from a transatlantic perspective, how would you characterize the most urgent needs for transatlantic cooperation to counter the rapid spread of online radicalization and extremist propaganda? Thank you, Chairman. Um, there, there's a lot of work ongoing, uh, international cooperation, which I would call really soft diplomacy efforts um, to try and nudge the tech companies in the right direction. So that the best example of that is the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism and a lot of the initiatives that were set up following Christchurch. That said, um, from my experience, the tech companies are most willing to respond in um, you know, being very frank in, in moments of tragedy. So we, we saw you know, after Christchurch and after January 6th that the tech companies will launch a knee-jerk reaction or they are willing to respond when governments impose legal and commercial imperatives to act. Um, this tends to lead to a knee-jerk 
knee-jerk reaction, inconsistent application of rules and regulations. It's very reactive rather than proactive. I do think that there is scope for America to look to what's been done internationally in terms of European governments placing restrictions on the tech companies and looking at the efficacy of that when it comes to impacts on terrorism prevention and moderation efforts. And I, 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 you know, I, I look forward to the to, to seeing the impacts of the soft diplomacy effort. But um, you know, bearing in mind my own understanding of how the tech companies are, uh, when the tech companies are most compelled to act, it tends to be when it's those legal and commercial imperatives uh, take take precedence. Okay, so let me follow up. If if they're good at responding at, uh, in the aftermath of tragedy, and they respond to pressure. What's the right way to get them to pay attention to this before there's another tragedy? So while I'm not an expert on um, big tech, uh, you know, big tech regulation efforts, um, from my experience, um, you know, governmental pressure does does take have an impact. Um, you know, the, the tech companies are looking at, for example, the um, designation list by the U.S. government. They look at the FTO list. They look at the SDGT list. Um, they are looking at government regulations, and we can use those kinds of mechanisms to push the tech companies in the right direction and to ensure that there's consistent application of their um, moderation efforts across different forms of extremism. This is where one of the greatest gaps has emerged in the last several years. Um, obviously, the um, efforts to, to designate white supremacist organizations have have um, really only just been given the attention that they deserve. Um, but there are some efforts that I think government can, can take to push companies in the right direction using those kinds of levers. I, um, I appreciate that. Uh, let me just uh, put a question out to the panel. When we're looking at the current threat landscape, as we try to address the, the race to counter it, um, where are we seeing the greatest similarities between the threats facing the U.S. and the threats facing Europe, and um, and how do we um, how, and can we uh, confirm that there are in fact those shared threats and prioritize them accordingly? I'll open that up to anyone with panel. Mr. Mr. Anidis, perhaps. Well, th th thank you very much. I, I think the the, uh, the 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 closest uh, really uh, in terms of uh, uh, the manifestation of uh, 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 what is going on both in the U.S. and uh, uh, in the European Union is the fact that uh, we do have. Uh, an increased number of uh, uh, individuals uh, 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 radicalizing and uh, uh, in be being in, in, in led to commit violent uh, uh, acts. And uh, uh, this, uh, for very different uh, uh, ideological uh, uh, reasons, and, and I think it was extremely well ex explained by uh, all the members of the panel that at the end of the day, uh, the ideological part was just uh, the, 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 the excuse, so to say, the, the packaging of why uh, the, the individual uh, would actually uh, do uh, commi and commit uh, such a violent act. Uh, but intrinsically, the motivations uh, uh, behind uh, the reasons, uh, the real reasons behind an individual being led to commit, commit such uh, uh, dreadful uh, acts uh, are exactly the same on both sides. Uh, we are also trying uh, to deploy the uh, similar uh, responses, uh, local responses, responses that use a multitude of uh, expertise from the medical side to the actual police side as well. They are all uh, important in order to better detect and better prevent uh, uh, such uh, uh, phenomenon. But this is really the essence of what uh, we both are trying uh, to fight barely, because these are the recent, the most recent, and uh, uh, also uh, the most numerous uh, attacks we have been facing over the last years. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks to all the witnesses for your participation today, and uh, thanks again to you, Chairman Keating, and I will. Uh, thank you again, Chairman. Look for. Uh, uh,
extraordinary uh, flexibility in, in coordinating this. And I want to thank our witnesses again. Usually I'm in a position where uh, I would be the first to ask questions, but uh, I now realize that, you know, it's always a uh, difficult task ending things up as well. But, you know, the title of, of today's hearing uh, is Transatlantic Cooperation Encountering Global Terrorism and Violent Extremism. And as we've heard through this hearing and the testimony of the witnesses, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's not a homogenous, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, discussion because uh, it's very distinctive and dynamic in many ways. Um, the types of challenges we face are diverse and the threats posed uh, are similarly diverse. There's domestic terrorism, there's individuals and, and groups engaged in grievance-based violence. Uh, there are those that are inspired, either online or, or through uh, activities within groups uh, to get involved and, and engage in this activity. And, and then around the world, there's so many different types uh, of terrorist organizations. I mean, you can't name them all. We, we focus so much now on, on Islamic State, I ask, but we're not looking, uh, you know, comprehensively sometimes on uh, the challenges we have. We, there's Boko Haram in Africa, Hamas in Gaza Strip, uh, Turkey and Taliban, Pakistan. You know, I could go on and on with a number of, uh, of different groups. So my question uh, is to the panel as a whole, but I, I'd like uh, uh, particularly Ms. Uh, uh, Romano Lingham to uh, deal with this because part of it is uh, preventative and de-radicalizing people. But how can we tailor uh, you know, our kind of actions uh, and to the whole group as well, you know, in terms of our resources, in terms of curbing the violence and deterring, but also uh, in programs of de-radicalization, uh, how can we tailor that or how much can we tailor that to specific groups and importantly, uh, by engaging specific groups in, you know, trying to thwart this activity. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start off and then hand over to the rest of the panel. Um, you know, my, my firm belief and, and based on my experience delivering this work across Europe is that we don't necessarily need programs focused on any one particular form of extremism. Yes, there are going to be cases that arise where ideology does need to be addressed, but actually the underlying um, skills which are required to deliver this work have nothing to do with the ideology itself. That said, the most effective programs do pair individuals at risk with someone who's likely to be credible and trusted with them. Oftentimes, many of the European programs that, that operate in this space use former extremists in that space because they, you know, they'll have credibility with those individuals. So that's the area in which those, those sorts of um, programs need to be tailored and offering that credibility. Credibility will ob obviously look very different for a white supremacist um, than it will be for someone who's at risk of jihadism. But broadly speaking, the underlying skills required by those practitioners are really um, behavioral health methodologies, you know, the, the skill sets that re are required within the behavioral health field, whether that's psychology, counseling, um, social work, or youth work. Um, and, and fundamentally, that's going to be the basis for any effective program, even here in the United States. Yeah, there's, a, there's some studies, I believe, uh, that actually uh, mention the, the value and, and uh, the multiplier effect and the effectiveness the efficacy of issues uh, of this nature, more uh, on the, in the hands of the involvement of women, uh, particularly mothers. They're often the first educators of their children. They're often the first people that can spot some of the signs of radicalization themselves. How important it is, is it to engage women, particularly, and empower women uh, in this effort? Is your question directed at, at me, Chairman? It would be. I'm happy to take it. On the preventative side, but others can chime in, particularly you, yes. Great. Great. I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, you're absolutely right that family members in particular, have they play a crucial role here. And many of the, the programs that were set up in Europe and which are now starting to develop in the U.S. are actually family counseling programs. These are programs for, um, you know, the, the fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers of people who are at risk, who are likely to be the first ones to spot the sign. Um, so that's a very important, um, those are very important nodes which can help us pull people back who are at risk. Um, women play an important role in that. I would also want to, to mention that we, we tend to focus our prevention efforts on men. I think there's an assumption here that men are the ones that are, are at greatest risk. 
we have increasing evidence to show that women are also involved in these movements, sometimes at high volumes. In particular, some of Moonshot's research has found that in the United States, 25% of people who are engaged in white supremacy content online are women um, who self-identify as women. So, you know, we can't ignore women in our prevention programs, and we do need to ensure we're, we're, we're building programs that are fit to serve women. Um, and I, I, yeah, I just want to make that point as well. Thank you. One last uh, thought, uh, and then we'll conclude. But, you know, in uh, the European Union and India discussed multiple ways to elevate security and strategic partnerships recently, and they included sanctions as a part of this as well. Just uh, any quick comments from uh, our panel regarding the how the U.S. And, or the U.S. and our transatlantic uh, allies together can engage uh, more regional partners outside our own coalition, uh, and what financial tools do we have uh, to try and thwart this? I'll just jump in as, as the former Treasury official uh, on the panel to say, we have great financial tools at our disposal. My concern is that they tend to be seen as a panacea. And uh, in the past few years, they've been used um, on their own when they were always meant to be used in tandem with other tools. Uh, diplomatic counterterrorism is a real thing, and we need to be doing a lot more of it. If we do more of it, we'll be able to bring in more regional allies, and we'll be able to work with them and our other allies, including the Europeans, on issues including but not limited to uh, the use of sanctions and other financial tools. The only other thing I'd like to say answering previous question is, you know, the, the panel here is about countering global violent extremism. Throughout the panel, we've basically broken it down, but we haven't made it clear. There's CVE at home, and then there's addressing the conflicts driving extremism abroad. I'm reminded, and I just looked it up in 20, 17, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence wrote one of its global trends reports. And it, when it was talking about what would significantly impact the future direction of the terrorist threat, it said, the resolution or continuation of the many intra and interstate conflicts currently underway, most importantly, the Syrian war, but also the conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, the Sahel, Somalia, Yemen, and elsewhere, will determine the intensity and geography of future violence. Our, our transatlantic cooperation on helping each other counter violent extremism within one another's borders, is that really good? It's not so great, and it needs improvement on working together to solve big problems abroad. Oh, thank you. I think uh, on that note, uh, I think it just underscores uh, one of the fundamental uh, lessons we learned today through this hearing is that this is a dynamic problem, and it requires a dynamic approach. Uh, merely, as you mentioned, uh, throwing sanctions at the issue it could be one tool in the toolbox, but certainly not uh, something that will accomplish the, the goals that we want. Uh, prevention, uh, involvement, uh, understanding uh, how this happens, the fact that uh, this is ideological in so many instances and we have to be aware of that and be aware of how to effectively deal with that are all things you brought up in, in your uh, uh, testimony today, as well as the, the overarching theme that we have a tremendous advantage here in the U.S. of having uh, a coalition, a historic coalition, uh, particularly with our European allies to, and our transatlantic partners to deal with this. So uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, I think it was extraordinarily important uh, and, and the perspective uh, was, was correct. So I uh, appreciate your involvement here today. Uh, I'll advise the members they have five days to submit statements, extraneous material and questions for the record subject to the length limitations on the rules. Uh, I want to thank the members who participated uh, during such a, a difficult time uh, of having concurrent votes uh, for their interest uh, and their questions. And with that, uh, I call this hearing uh, adjourned. Thank you all.